are here for a fermentation workshop slash presentation. Um, I'm going to be going over all different sorts of things as far as the health benefits of it, um, as well as we're going to be making some sauerkraut and a couple of other things. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through it so everybody hopefully by the end of this is going to feel comfortable. They're going to feel safe and confident in fermenting when you guys uh, get home. So. Um, I am a bit of a geek when it comes to fermentation. I really enjoy digging into everything, going through the science of it, and understanding why everything works. Uh, the way that kind of my brain works is if I understand why it works and how it works, I'm much more likely to do that. I know a lot of people are like that, and some people aren't, and that's totally cool. Uh, but before we get going, I'm going to kind of gauge, because we are running a little bit behind in the schedule, how many of you guys are going to head out immediately as soon as the pig processing thing starts? I won't be offended. Okay, so I'll try and kind of speed through things just to try and make sure that this thing ends on time. So it's going to be a little bit uh, clicking through things a little bit more rapidly than I would have otherwise. But um, turn this thing on. There we go. My name is Anna. Um, I have been fermenting for probably about 10 years now. And I started a YouTube channel right around six years ago. And um, that's kind of been my obsession and my passion for probably about the last decade. Um, I, we are originally from Washington State. We moved to Missouri probably about two and a half years ago, and we've just been happy and uh, kind of living our best life while we've been here. Um, this is my husband, Robert, and this is my 22-year-old son, Malachi. And he, he moved with us, and right now he is actually in Florida helping with the cleanup um, from the hurricane down there, so keep me in your prayers. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Fermented Homestead, I do mostly videos revolving around homesteading and fermentation. I used to do a bunch of canning videos, but I don't really can a whole lot anymore. So um, right now, most of it is just my obsession with building my business and, and trying to keep up with videos and, and things like that. But um, most of my life has just been revolved around building up a fermentation business. It's called Crunchy Cultures. I make all different kinds of ferments and things like that. I don't, I don't sell them in stores just yet. It's all just kind of local stuff, just kind of building, building stuff from the ground up. Um, I have uh, been kind of obsessed with the taste of pickles and sauerkraut since I was a little kid. That is me and my three sisters, it's kind of a cuter picture in person. But um, from the time that we were teeny tiny little itty bitty things, any time that we went over to my family's houses, they would always stock their fridges with pickles because they knew that me and my sister would just completely devour them. And, but I honestly, I had no idea that, I, I didn't know anything about fermentation. I didn't know any of that. I mean, I was literally raised on top ramen. And you know, if, if things were looking good, we had macaroni and cheese because that meant we had milk in the fridge. Like I did not raise, I was not raised with any comprehension. I was in the tenth grade when I first learned that you're supposed to actually have meat with most meals. <laughs> like, did no knowledge of it whatsoever. I'm, I'm not even joking. Um, and then I literally spent the thir first 30 years of my life destroying my body, destroying my health, and I, I, like, it was bad. So um, I actually came upon Sandor Katz and the art of fermentation uh, trying through my quest to heal my body. And it kind of just took off after that. So um, that is a picture of me back, and, whoa. Um, that is a picture of me back in 2012. You can't really see it very clearly on there, but it's, it's definitely noticeable. Um, that I just, in the middle? what's that? Is that you in the middle? Uh, no, that is me on that side. Oh, wow. Okay. Right there, yes. Um, I actually I topped out at about 300 pounds and um, wow. and had all of the all of the health deficits that go along with that the yeah. achy joints the moods the all the mental clarity or lack thereof like everything that went along with it and I one day I just got sick of it and I was just like how can I how can I figure out how to do this get sick to get sick of it right yeah yeah sometimes <laughs> you just got to get sick enough to to be sick of it exactly um, and so basically my whole life, you know, it was junk food, it was, I smoked, you know, antibiotics, medications, yo-yo dieting, drinking alcohol, all of those sorts of things that just kind of destroyed my health. Soda. And, what's that? Soda. Soda. Oh gosh, I was obsessed with soda. I drank so much soda and then I, and then back, the first thing that I did was switch to Diet Coke because I thought it was healthier. Oh, wow. And then I drank that, like, instead of water for yeah. probably a good five years. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Drinking water was a curse, right? Oh, was that? Drinking water was like a curse. I know. Uh, literally, I, I think I probably went, like, three months without drinking any water. It was all just Diet Coke. It was terrible. Um, and then, um, so I just, I started to educate myself. I, am, I have a master's degree from the School of Hard Knocks and a doctorate from the University of Google. So I want to make sure that everybody understands. I am not college educated. I do not have an all-encompassing education. Um, ah, darn it. 
There we go. Um, so just a disclaimer for everybody, I'm just a geek with Google. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a health professional, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist. Everything that I talk about is based on my experience, my interpretation, and the information that I have available to me, and my understanding of it. So as with everything, please do your own research. Um, audience participation. I promise this will be very brief and mildly painless. How many of you guys have fermented before? Fan freaking tastic. Of those who haven't, are you interested in fermentation? Why haven't you done it? Can somebody shout out some answers? Too busy with other things. Too busy with other things, not enough time. Got it. Time. You don't like it? <laughs> Girl, you need to try some stuff. I just want to keep going. She hasn't had the right stuff. <laughs> exactly. Anybody else? Some of the main answers that I typically end up getting is food safety. They think they're going to die. Um, if they're very confused by a lot of the, the multitudes of information that is available on the internet, time, and their fear of failure. Um, so basically, as far as failing is concerned, um, I brought a few examples. These are just kind of the most recent ones. I've been fermenting for over 10 years and I still fail regularly. Um, I just recently had to throw away a three gallon size crock, 30 pound batch of beet kraut because it didn't ferment quickly enough and it got a little bit uh, slimy and I just, you know, I, I don't make three gallon batches for myself but for, for sales and so uh, it just, it didn't go the way I wanted it to and so I ended up just having to dump it. Like, don't be afraid of failure, embrace it, learn the lessons that you learned from it, understand why it went wrong and you can kind of move forward from there. I learned, don't use old beets. <laughs> They're gonna get kind of slimy, you know? And that is just because a different set of bacteria takes over and it, it goes a different route. It will recover. If that was for myself, I probably would have consumed it. But if I'm selling it to other people, I make sure that everything is exact, because, you know, safety first. Um, and as far as confusing, most people are confused because you read all different kinds of things that all seem counter, like they're, they're conflicting with one another. And the main reason for that is they're all correct. There are very few things that you can do in fermentation that are incorrect. Uh, the main one is just breeding the wrong type of bacteria. If you are doing one of these type of vegetable ferments, block out the oxygen. Don't put a towel on it. And if you are making something like kombucha, it needs to breathe. So this is not a good example, but when you're actually fermenting it, you're gonna put a cloth lid over it because you want it to breathe. You want it to have air. That's really one of the only things that I can think of that would actually have a negative impact on, on anything is just lack of oxygen or, um, or too, too much oxygen. Other than that, just about anything is right. The, how, you can ferment it for however long you want. You can put almost any ingredients that you want in there. I'll cover a few things that you really don't want to do a little bit later on, but really, you know, the sky's the limit. And as far as food safety, most of us are afraid of uh, botulism. I was very afraid of botulism when I first got started. I made probably six different batches of ferments before I actually decided to consume one of my homemade ferments because I was legitimately terrified. I'm not, I'm not I mean, if, if, if you guys are scared, you're not, you're not, you're in good company. Like, it, it is something that we're conditioned to believe in. But I do have good news. Um, there has actually never been a documented case of a tested botulism case inside of a jar of fermented foods ever in the history of the entire CDC website. I checked, I counted. But there were a lot of other people doing stupid stuff that we're gonna go over just real quick. There were 27 unknown cases, 22 from home cooking. Almost all of them were people who left the potatoes out on the counter for like four days and then thought it would be a good idea to eat them. Um, two from deer antler tea, delicious. Um, two, one from infused garlic oil, 20 from gas station nacho cheese, nine from hot dog chili sauce, 37 from prison hooch, uh, 16 from Chile at a single event in 2001, and 16 just from standard commercial food. People just like eating bulging, bulging cans, damaged stuff, like it, pretty much all of them say it was very obvious they should not have consumed it. There were 106 from meat products. And this is from 2001 to 2019, I think I skipped forward on that one. It's about 18 cases per year. Um, and basically just all of these very strange sounding things, stink heads, stink fish, stink eggs, Eskimo salad with whale oil, like all just, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's mostly just, mostly, most of those are from Alaskan Inuit food. That's about it. And there were 100 from home canned foods. Almost all of them were just improperly or rebel canned type of things. 
27 of them were from a single um, church potluck in 2001 uh, from improperly home canned potatoes. So, you know. Um, there were seven that were from fermented foods. However, um, six of those were from fermented bean curd and tofu, which is a completely different process. You cook the things, you kill everything off, and then you add things to it. It's a totally different process. Nothing like vegetables. And there was one suspected case from kimchi back in 2011. However, most standard kimchis are made with fish sauce and um, shrimp paste. So, I mean, given the otherwise completely perfect record, I would say it's probably not the cabbage that brought it on. So I hope that that kind of helps you guys get a little bit less um, fearful of fermented foods. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to skip through like anything that doesn't, doesn't, isn't really too, too awful. But um, the reason that that is able to happen is that, it, that botulism and just pretty much every other pathogenic form of bacteria cannot survive in a salty, acidic, and airless is, is you know, hit or miss. Some, some can survive in air, some can, cannot. Like botulism thrives in an airless environment, but it cannot survive in a salty and acidic environment. So you are creating the perfect environment for the really good lacto-fermentation type of bacteria. What's that? Yes, exactly. You're naturally preserving it. You're creating the environment for the good guys to thrive and the bad guys can't. I mean, it's just that simple. Um, anything under 3.7 pH, there's no pathogenic bacteria that I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that can survive under 3.7 and almost everything is more like 3.2 to 3.5, um, but just about everything is perfectly fine under 4.6, which is like just kind of a little bit acidic, like it's, it's almost nothing when you're at that. Um, so most of us are told to wash your hands. Uh, don't touch doorknobs, don't get dirty, sanitize everything, go to the doctor. Ferments are basically just rotten food, right? Like we're all kind of taught that. But you have to understand when you're getting into fermentation, it is the completely opposite mindset. You really want to get away from the kill everything kind of mindset and get towards the, we're going to culture the good and the bad is just naturally going to die off and be gone. Uh, oh, right. Um, we want to make sure that we're creating a healthy ecosystem, whether that's on the homestead, on our skin, inside of our bodies, kitchens, gardens, animal pens, you name it. There is a proper bag, good healing, not healing, but a good uh, bacteria for every single type of, of situation. You know, if you, yes, non-toxic, like we're, we're just, we're, we're culturing the good, knowing that we're giving it the environment that the good stuff need, and they'll just, they'll take care of the bad guys. Like we don't really have to be concerned with it. So make mud pies, garden without gloves, go barefoot, do all of these things listed here. We're just we're skipping through, I'm sorry. Uh, fermentation um, is basically just the yeast, the enzymes, the bacteria. They consume the carbohydrates that are in whatever food that you have and they turn it into energy, they turn it into acids and they, that is their fuel, is the carbohydrates that are in it. So if you have a food like carrots that are higher in carbohydrates, it's gonna ferment much more quickly than you would something like a cabbage. Does that make sense? Um, these are all of the things that I could think of off the top of my head that are naturally fermented. Even most of these, even today, they are still naturally fermented. You got sauerkraut, kombucha, pickles, kimchi, alcohol, fish sauce, cheese, tempeh, vinegar, water kefir, and milk kefir. Milk kefir deserves its own special category in ferments. Uh, this is actually milk kefir that I let go on the counter just so you guys could see what happened to, happens to it. It separates into the whey and the solids. This here is a jar of the most powerful probiotic food on planet Earth. There have been more than a hundred different strains of microorganisms that have been found in this, and it is very common and standard for it to have at least 35 to 50 different strains of microorganisms in it. And it is, if you do the research on this like I have, it is insanely powerful. It has been shown to even defeat things like botulism, C. diff, um, all different kinds of bacterial intestinal infections. And I am talking about the homemade stuff. The stuff that you buy in the store is a completely different product. It is a kefir-like product. It is made with a very certain set of strains of bacteria that are used to make a certain product. So if you want the good stuff that is the most amazing thing on the face of planet Earth, you gotta make it yourself, sorry. It's very easy though. I had intended to show you guys how to make it, but I think we're gonna skip through that. I do, however, have an obsessive number of videos on my YouTube channel that you can find teaching you guys how to make milk kefir. Any of you guys are local, I'd be more than happy to share my grains with you, um, but I don't have any with me here today. Well, no, I do. You can try these and see if they work, but um, 
it may not. Um, so let's make some sauerkraut. All right. So I already made some sauerkraut earlier today. So I think I'm going to skip through the first portion of it because that'll save us probably about 10 minutes. So um, basically all you do, as far as time goes, you're looking at max five minutes, absolute max. And you have a jar of fermented foods. It is, however, in two different portions. You've got to cut it up. Like you're just basically cut it up however you want the end product to be. I can, tend to like it to be a little bit on the thicker side. You can sliver it up into tiny little pieces if you'd like. You can even dice it up. You can do whatever you like with it. Um, but these are kind of what I like, and it tends to be what customers enjoy as well. So probably, what's that? Between like an eighth and a quarter of an inch. And I, I'm not even remotely picky with it. I just cut it up and I'm done with it. And that's all I do. So once you get it on there, you're gonna salt it. It's, there is an exact number of two to 2.5 percent of the weight as salt. So if you have, you don't have to remember this, but if so, if you have a thousand grams, you weigh this, and it weighs one thousand grams. It's easier to do in grams. Sorry if you guys are anti-metric system, but you know it's just easier. Um, one thousand grams, two percent of that is twenty grams. You just literally take the decimal point, you move it over two points, and that gives you ten. Double it, you got twenty. And that's how much salt you're going to add to this if you want to be exact, if you want to be precise. However, like a one to two tablespoons is usually good for a head of cabbage about, you know, this size. Like an, an average to medium size head of cabbage, you need about one to two tablespoons. I'm gonna show you exactly how you can tell. You just put the salt on, you kind of mix it, mash it up a little bit, almost like you're making bread. Taste it. Does it taste kind of like a lightly salted potato chip? That's it. it. There's not, like I said, there are so many different, a range of so many different things you can do with fermentation. There's almost no wrong answer. If you put a tremendous amount of salt in there, it's just not going to ferment the right set of cultures. And if you go under, it's going to get mushy and it's not going to ferment the way that you want it to. So like, you'll know, like, if you're missing the salt, like it's going to go bad. So it's, it's not like the end of the world. You're not going to accidentally poison yourself. You're going to look at it and you're going to be like, Oh, gross. You know, like, that's the nice thing about it. There's no, there's no hidden poisons with fermentation. It's mold. It's, you know, an overgrowth of yeast. It's, you know, it'll get soggy and disgusting. It'll get slimy. Like, you know, you'll, you'll look at that and you'll be like, you couldn't pay me to eat that, you know? Like, you'll know if it's wrong. There's, there's no secrets. There's not, nothing hidden. So, I did this at 11 o'clock. So, what's that, like, two and a half hours ago? And you just do that. I had it covered up with a bag. You can use a tea towel, whatever you like. You set it aside. And then you'll see it's, I don't know how well you guys can see, but it's very moistery. Sorry. I just made that, obviously. Okay, so you can tell when it's done. I mean, it literally, the salt draws the moisture out, and that's what you need to use to cover up your, your cabbage when you're done, right? All right. We forgot to bring towels. So we'll just pack a little bit of this in the jar. I'll, you can use a mason jar. You can go and purchase one of those fancy crocs. I have several of them, probably about 30. Um, but all you need when you're first getting started is a mason jar. That's it. Don't go out and invest in a whole bunch of stuff unless you absolutely know that you love this. Then you can go and get the crocs. You can get the lids. You can get all the fancy stuff. A mason jar and a standard mason lid, literally all you need. But... Let's just go ahead and pack in a couple handfuls so you can kind of see how to kind of pack this in. Just put a couple handfuls in, literally all your might. You really want to pack it in there. Unless you're my husband, you don't use all his might. He's got a lot of might. But um, so you can, how many of you guys can, this thing is like giving feedback or something. Um, can you guys see the moisture that's coming off of here? That's what you're looking for. You want to make sure Thank you. Oh, thank you. It took me like four seconds to register what you actually gave me. So you just do that in batches when you're filling up the jar, right? Because if you put, if you fill up the jar completely full, you're going to have a really hard time squishing it well enough to get all the oxygen out. If you don't get all the oxygen out, it's not the end of the world because the first part of the fermentation is bacteria that consume, us, consume air. And so they're going to go through and munch through anything that you do have in there, and they're going to replace it with carbon dioxide, which is perfectly safe and fine. So we're going to pretend that this jar is about this full. 
you want to stop almost double what you would when you're canning, right? You want to have about an inch, inch of head space, go with about two. That's why even if you're not going to make a whole lot in these jars, usually sizing up one size, don't, don't go too heavy, but sizing up about one size, it'll usually give you enough head space. Um, I also did not bring a phone, so I don't have a clue what time it is. If anybody could shout out like a 10 minute warning, because I don't want anybody to kind of miss out on who's going to head to the pig processing thing. Okay, so we need to make sure that everything inside this jar stays under the brine. Oxygen is the enemy in fermentation when you're doing this type of fermentation. You, you really don't want it. It's not just the oxygen, it's also what, ha what is in that air. Mold spores, all kinds of other things. You wanna make sure that you're doing the best that you can to where you're not gonna introduce mold in here. That's your number one enemy with fermentation. And air is just how it gets in there. So you can take your mason jar lid. This is a tank top. Uh. Trying to, trying to do a shortcut here and it's not working. There we go. So, all right. So basically you can take your canning ring if you're doing it inside of a mason jar and you just trace it, a piece of cabbage that you, that you set aside. You're gonna do about three or four of those layers with the top one being the core. Right, you got this nice thick spine, and you're gonna put that one on top. And that's just my personal opinion. I just find that that works really well to have that nice firm piece. It kind of helps hold everything underneath the brine. And then you, you you can get these online. They're very cheap. I mean, you're looking at probably about two dollars a piece, maybe. Um, you can get them on Amazon. You, you don't have to go with the name brands. Like it's pointless to go with the name brands, other than they have a nice little handle to them. But you can literally for the first two years that I fermented, I just went. Is this like really echoey and feedback you guys? Oh. Microphones don't like each other, but I feel like that's better. I'm going to try that for a minute. Um, but for the first two years that I fermented, I went out into my backyard. I found rocks that fit inside of the mason jar. I boiled it. I cleaned it, made sure it was very clean. Um, but then I literally used a rock because uh, you have to keep it weighted down. The point of these little glass candy things, you put it in there and it kind of helps to weigh it down and it'll hold everything underneath the brine, right? We're eliminating the oxygen. These are just a fancy way to do it, but you can do a rock. What about marbles? Marbles would probably work. Yeah, I'd maybe put them inside of a Ziploc or something like that. Otherwise they'll kind of get, they'll eventually start to sink down. But anything that's sanitary, anything that you can clean, that you can keep under here. I use Ziploc bags all the time. I don't really use them too much anymore, but anything that you can use to weigh it down. You could even use, if you have those teeny little four ounce jelly jars, you can use those just turn it turn it put it in here and put it on there i've seen a lot of people do that i've never really tried it um but you can totally do that anything that you can use that is non-corrosive you can use in there like what glass is great stone is great whatever you can think of you can even use plastic i do use ziploc bags every once in a while just don't use anything aluminum that's uh, so that's about the only only guideline and that's because it's corrosive and you'll leach the toxins from the aluminum into it because this is going to become very acidic so, and then all you have to do is cover it with a lid of some sort. Like I said, you can absolutely use one of these guys right here, uh, just a standard mason jar lid. You're just gonna wanna come by for the first about five to six days, every day, you're gonna come through and it's gonna, you'll, you'll start to feel it. You, you know, like when you're, it, it'll, it'll have a hard bulge, you just, just like that, just burp it. It's literally called burping it. You just really fast. You don't want to leave it open just enough to let the pressure escape, but hopefully not enough to let any of the air back in. That's all you got to do. But then you can also invest in some of these lids. You can get a kit of two of these ones at Walmart for like 10 bucks or something like that. It comes with a spring that's completely useless, but they give it to you just in case. Um, these ones, they're all right, but I don't, I don't usually use these ones. It comes with a little pump and you can pump all the air out of it to kind of expedite the fermentation. Um, I don't like anything that expedites fermentation, so um, I just don't use them. These are my go-to when I'm at home. These little toppers here, you can get them at your local brew shop. There's one in Springfield called, called um, Show Me Brewing. They sell these things. They are phenomenal. They are almost completely fail-safe, um, except unless you let them dry up like I did with this one. So I brought it as an example so you can see on the inside uh, at the end. 
um, what happens when you don't, yeah. Um, so anyways, <laughs> these work fantastically. You can get the whole kit. You can get a kit of four of these things. Typically they will come with these weights. Amazon, you're talking like a set of four of each thing for, I want to say like 15 bucks. Like if you're into fermentation, 15 bucks is a pretty cheap way to get started. Um, but yeah, all you do is you just put it on there. Remember, we're pretending that we did this correctly and that everything is submerged under the brine and it's up to about here and we got plenty of, plenty of air space there. You just take this thing that is in three different parts. You got this little cup that's got all these fancy little holes in them and then it's got like a straw. It's literally, you can see through this straw. Put this on top of there into the lid you could you can also i mean if you're if you're really on a on a budget and you got some extra stuff and you got grommets and all that kind of fancy stuff laying around you can drill a hole in it yourself i've never done that but you can then you're just going to fill up the top here just like that pop it on there if you're in the middle of summer cover this with a cloth i promise you my my husband uh, made a lot of, um, had made a bunch of alcohol fruit flies will absolutely get through these holes, promise you. But if you're in winter, usually right now the fruit flies aren't prominent enough, it's not really an issue, but you know, just know your own environment. If you got a lot of fruit flies, just cover it up with a cloth. Like you don't need to secure it, nothing. Just there's little holes in the top that allow the oxygen to um, escape. I doubt you guys can see it, but there's a bunch of little holes in the top of this lid. And that is just to allow the, the pressure to release, but that also allows fruit flies to get in. However, even if the fruit flies do get into here, they will not be able to get into here. But this thing will get kind of funky. So just kind of bear that in mind. And you can fill this up with water. You can fill it up with um, a salt brine. If you've got extra salt brine, that'll make it not evaporate quite as quickly. Just check on it like every two, three days, you know, depending on the time of year, if it's summer and you know, like things are evaporating really quickly, check on it more often. During the winter, it's usually not an issue whatsoever. So that is kind of um, sauerkraut in a, in a nutshell. What time are we at? What's that? Oh my gosh. Okay, so let's get to food. let's get to animal food. Sorry to rush this, guys. I had a whole presentation, but um, so animal food. This is the same exact amount of animal feed, exactly the same, and it's actually from Peterson. I've been buying them from them since I moved to Missouri. Um, this is two cups of animal food. This is also two cups of animal food, and it has risen to here. I filled this up two days ago, and this is a fantastic way to make your, make your budget stretch. If you can't afford organic feed, or um, you, know, you can use this with organic feed, you can use it with pellets, you can use it with anything. Basically, all it does is it ferments the feed, and it unlocks a lot of the nutrients. Yes? Do you do that in buckets? Yes, I normally do. I just did it in here just, just so you guys can kind of see the, the visual of it. Usually I do use uh, three, uh, the five gallon buckets when I'm, when I'm doing it. I'm not doing it right now. I'm late. just, can't, I can't absorb one more thing to do in my life. So <laughs> I'm not doing it currently, but I did it for you guys so you guys can kind of see it. It will expand, it will grow very rapidly. A lot of people might think, why do I need to ferment it? Why don't I just soak it overnight in water? There is a very, very important reason for that is that if you do not ferment these, all you're gonna do is expand the grains Fill your animal's stomachs and they're not going to get enough nutrients. They're going to produce less. They're going to grow slower. You really have to take the extra step of fermenting it for about three days, depending on the time of year, to extract all of the nutrients from, from the grains. This is almost completely irrelevant for anything that has a rumen. You don't really have to do this for like cows or goats or anything like that. You can. They will benefit from it, but they ferment their own feed inside of their rumen. That's what, that's what it's there for, so you don't really have to do it, but chickens, pigs, dogs, cats, whatever, whatever you got that does not have a rumen, they will benefit greatly and they love it. They will be absolutely obsessed with it. I promise you, if you get them used to the, the, the first couple times, they might balk at it. But once they get into it and they realize how delicious it is, if you give them dry feed and you give them fermented feed, I promise you the fermented feed will be gone immediately. And then eventually maybe they'll come for the dry stuff, but they, yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. Um, the way that I typically do it with animal feed, five gallon buckets, I've got three of them because it's a three day ferment. I literally just do a Sharpie. I mark on each one, one, two, three. 
and then it's just a constant rotation. When, when, I'm, when I'll fill up one, and then the next day I'll do two, the next day I'll do three, and then the next day I'll do one, two, three, one, two, three. And every day when I'm done feeding the animals from whatever day it is, I just fill it up and I put it at the end of the line. I just kind of rotate everything. It's really quick, really easy. It might add like five minutes tops onto your chores, depending on how many animals you got. Took a little bit longer than that when we had pigs, but we are out of the pig business, so. So it's just their feed? It's just a standard feed. Could you use dog food? I've never tried it with dog food. I probably wouldn't because it has meat in it. Yeah. yeah. But you, you gave this to your dogs? I didn't give this to my dogs, no. Okay. I get this is chicken feed. Okay. As we, we just have chickens and ducks right now, so. So what's your ratio? Um, it's usually like you'll fill it up and then um, it'll grow to about double the size. So I usually put about triple the amount of water in it. Okay. You can put double the amount of water as well, but I like to have a little bit of extra brine in there. Just make sure you don't actually give chickens the extra water, try and dump it off or save it for the next batch. They just don't like it. They won't, they won't consume it if it's all submerged under water. Pigs don't care. So it's like one part feed, like three, parts, parts water. three parts water. The standard uh, recommendation is two parts water, um, but I just like to have that little extra brine. It helps the, the next, especially during the colder months, it kind of just helps to kickstart the next batch of fermentation and helps keep it on track. Any other questions with the, yes. To, the, to this, no, I don't add any salt to it at all. Um, there's not really, it's a short term ferment, so, and it's a very quick moving ferment because it has all the carbohydrates in it, so you don't typically need to add salt to keep it in the right, going in the right direction. Do you cover your I do, I put the lids on. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, it's hit or miss whether or not I will actually latch the lids, but I do put it on just to make sure that nothing can get in there, um, a particularly pest. Like, I mean, the mold and the yeast, they're going to grow no matter what. But, I mean, when's the last time? I mean, everybody feeds their moldy feed to the chickens. They don't care. What kind of salt do you use? Because most salts are very unhealthy. I don't use any salt in the animal food. But I do use, um, I was using Baja Gold Mineral Salt for a long time. And I just switched back to just a, a standard sea salt. You just want to make sure that you're avoiding anything that is iodized. Yeah, not, nothing is iodized. If you, if you can, a lot of um, good healthy salts will have their, their testing available for you online, and you can check to see if they have any contaminants in it. Uh, sea salts can be kind of particularly prone to um, microplastics, so you just want to be careful, make sure that you're getting it tested. Uh, Baja Gold is a good one. Um, I just, I stopped using it because it just, it wasn't working the way that I needed it to work uh, for, in, in my fermentation business. Um, I, I do... I haven't used that a whole like, lot. Like, yeah, yeah. I haven't used that a whole lot, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. But sand, like some, you know, yeah, it has a lot of leftover minerals. So that's why I tend to go with the the sea salt for for business fermentation. Um, but for my own personal fermentation, I, I use Baja Gold um, just because I can I can wait the extra time and and you know I can deal with a little bit of a, a sideways movement on the fermentation without an issue. But for business, like I need I need it to work. Yeah. Yeah, same thing as the Baja. Yeah, it's just, it's just, um, it's just, what is it? It's not um, as processed or it's not animal, or it's not technically human grade. Is that right? No, but Baja is. Uh, Baja is, yeah. Content. But you know what? I'm sorry. I think that she's thinking all Oh yeah, I, I would have no issue with the, with the the C90 for for my own personal. I have a bag of it. I bought it, um, but it's just exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I have friends who use the C90 for for personal use as well. It's just when you're making it for business, you have to you know use hand, human grade stuff. So <laughs> yeah. Oh great. Because they put folic acid, they put red dyes in the pet food. So, you know, it, even though it says it's not consumption for humans, you can probably eat that too. Yeah. Because it doesn't have all that fat in it. Exactly. Especially, especially their stuff. Exactly. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. Um, if you guys will indulge me for just one other moment, I can, uh, get, I can tell you guys very briefly how you can incorporate fermented stuff into your gardens as well. Um, the first one is the most obvious. If you have a, a fermentation that went wonky, pop it in your compost. You'll inoculate it with the bacteria that was in here, 
and you just kind of mix it in and let it ferment. Um, another thing that I like to do is I just take my, like my chicken coop, the leftovers, I throw it in one of those 55 gallon tubs, fill it, fill it up, cover it with water and forget about it for about six months. Um, you don't have to forget about it for six months. You can use it like a month later. It'll, it'll ferment for that amount of time. It will smell absolutely as awful as you would imagine. Um, but you can do that both, both ways. You can do it aerobic by adding, you know, like when you're making the compost tea and you put the bubbler in there and it, and it incorporates the oxygen in there, that one will smell better. I mean, it's still fermented chicken poop, so it's not gonna smell great. But if, and then you can also, you can close it off, which is what I typically do because I don't have the patience to sit there and babysit this thing. Like I am a set it and forget it kind of gal. Like I have way too much going on in my life as I'm sure a lot of you guys do. I just set it and forget it, put the lid on there. And I did that in April and I still haven't touched it. And you can also do the same thing with, you just literally grab your weeds, try not to get any seeds in there if you're, if you're not planning to filter it. But if you are filtering it, it does not matter whatsoever. But you just grab all your weeds, throw it in a 55 gallon barrel, throw it in a five gallon bucket, throw it in, a, you know, throw it in one of these, right? Same thing. And you're just gonna add the water to it and you're just gonna let it ferment for a long time. Like, and then at the end of it, you dilute it a lot, like a lot. Like, a few, like you really need maybe like a cup per gallon and you, like that's all you have to do with it and you just spread it on your garden. Uh, yes. Yes, um, that particular one, I kind of used the method from uh, David the Good. He calls it swamp juice. For very obvious reasons, as soon as you smell it, it smells like swamp juice. But it works amazing on your garden. You're inoculating it with all of these things that are in throughout the fermentation process. You're giving it aerobic bacteria as well as anaerobic bacteria, which you need both in a garden. You need, you need both of them because like, you know, once you go down a couple inches, there's no oxygen. So you need bacteria that can survive in an oxygen-free environment. It's really just that simple. Um, but any other questions on that? Sorry, you guys had such a rough experience. I just don't want to make anybody miss out, out on the out on the other thing. But um, if you guys are interested in a bit more of an expanded view of this particular presentation, I do have part of it kind of posted on. I've, I've tweaked it since then, but you can check out one I did back in April. Um, it was the Keepers of the Old Ways. Uh, it's got a little bit more of the sciencey kind of information that I planned on discussing with you guys. Um, but also, if you, guys, if you guys have any questions or comments or, you know, queries or whatever you'd like, I'll, I'll be at my tent until the end of the event. You can come and pick my brain. You can come and try out different samples. And I'm always happy. I'm truly obsessed with fermentation. So I would, I, nothing brings me more joy than talking about fermentation. So um, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. How did I do on time? You did good. 205. 205? I did that whole thing in 40 minutes. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. About the... Uh...